where science fiction meets pop culture. We're the podcast that covers everything pop culture and beyond the multiverse. Are you ready to get your geek on? Crank up the DeLorean, warm up the proton packs, toss a coin to your witcher, and deep dive into your favorite plate of chimichangas. This is Pop X Cast. You are listening to Pop X Cast, where science fiction meets pop culture. Here we go! Pop X Cast. I was born in it, molded by it. Pop X Cast. <laughs> More human than human is our motto. Here's Johnny. Never had a pet pony. Hasta la vista, baby. Pawbex cast. Captain's log supplemental. Negasonic teenage. What the s? I am the one who knocks. Excelsior, what is up, Pop Xers? And my neighbors is driving around in a four wheeler because you know what? Rednecks do exist in Florida. What is up, Pop X? <laughs> How's everybody doing tonight? What's going What's on? What's up, man? How doing you doing? Wonderful. Wait a minute. What happened to Mike? <laughs> did he shrink? He's, I, he's oh did he lose some weight? God. Or, he, I, I, I mean, is he, he mutated. Did he changed his clothes? I, I don't know. Fits oh, my haircut? Oh, my lap. gosh. Look at that. Is that is that Buddy? That's Buddy, man. He wanted to make a cameo at the beginning. He's he's very clingy today he, for he, some he, reason. I don't he, know. Is cl- he is a nice clingy dog, though. I think he should be an honorary <laughs> member of Team Papa. I think he should oh, be. Oh, Buddy. He's so good. <laughs> Yeah, so good. Yeah, he's what so is happy. up, I talk Marvel? It's good to see you over in the chat. I see you, buddy. Thank you for hanging with us. <laughs> Holy cow, the chat room is blowing up tonight. You guys are just making us feel so warmly welcomed. And um, it is true. Mike, uh, Mike Ippolito did transform and mutate into a French bulldog. And so this this happened. This is a real thing. And so I think um, it was Agatha after all. It was Agatha. Right. Yeah. All I blame along. Mephisto. It's Mephisto My all day long. No, oh, I have no right. idea what's yes. going on right now, but I am and just rolling with it because we're going to have a fun. <laughs> Bueller, <laughs> I have no idea what's going on. What is going on, chat room over over in Popex dot live? All of our friends, if you want to participate in this crazy chat room, what's going on right now? We got a bunch of people over here blowing it up. Uh, yes. We got Michelle Alexander, The View with the Drew. What's going on, Luke Darth Baca? Uh, Bandits, Michael Murray, John Poffenbarger, I talk Marvel. Wow. Holy cow, Dez. What's up, Dez? Hey, Dez, thank you. Desi in the house. And we've got (laughs) Jeremy Stoltz, everybody, just chimed in. Wow. Oh, my gosh. I think he's uh, simulcasting us on his drawing show right now. I think so. I think think we're getting a little bit of that cross. I like that word, cross-pollination. I love cross-pollinating. Anyway. So, um, with that said, uh, welcome everybody. This is episode 126 on July the 11th. Wait, 7 11. Hey, I like that. Wow. Slurpee. Did anybody get a Slurpee? I didn't Slurpee get a, day. Oh, it is Slurpee Day. Slurpee Day. On I a think Sunday? I'm giving away free Slurpees or something. I, I I Are you a, serious? And I missed that? Here, I'll just have a sip of LaCroix and we'll just, we'll just well, call it even. It's, it's not midnight diet. yet. Unkiss. Go get it. <laughs> I have no idea what's going on. This segment of Pop X Cast is brought yeah. to you in part by Raz Cranberry LaCroix. Mm. LaCroix. 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 <laughs> Lindsay and I both did that. I We're both lame, right. Lindsay. Anyway, okay. Austin Burke, <laughs> open us up on <laughs> the show and let's get this thing going, bro. Well, guys, you all are lighting up the chat. Welcome to Pop X, where science fiction meets pop culture. 
I'm Austin Burke, and this is Buddy, uh, but I'm the Appalachian geek at heart. We'd like to welcome everyone joining us live in the PopX.live chat room. You guys can come hang out with us and join the conversation at PopXCast.com. If this is your first time tuning into PopX, the first 10 to 15 minutes or so, we run down the headlines since our last show, and then we dive deep into all things nostalgic on the retro rewind and there's something strange in the neighborhood today that's all i'll say i, I don't uh, know there was some ectoplasm on my toilet seat earlier and really? i went to sit down and you i know slid who we're gonna call about that Does mr anybody... mcfeely that's, yes, I, that's... I, I i don't know i i will say this much i went to sit down on my own toilet today there was some ectoplasm on the seat i don't oh, know think mm. that anyway let's, let's not oh, even oh, go there I uh, i'm joseph <laughs> We'll get into it. But at the, at the halfway point, after that's over with today, God <laughs> we're going to talk. If you guys are here to talk about Black Widow, we're going to be talking spoilers. So at mm. that point, if you haven't mm -hmm. seen it, either turn away or we're going to warn you. You don't have to. You don't want to. We'll see. Yes, indeed. A retro Rewind is going to be lit and slimy and paranormal today. <laughs> I'm so excited. And, uh, you know, I will say this much. Um, we will be doing Ghostbusters 2 on Halloween because it was in 89. Get it? Uh, so yeah. this is why I want to get one out of the way so we can talk yes. about Halloween Ghostbusters 2. Yes. I am Joseph Burke, Central Florida seasoned comic book nerd and retro enthusiast. And I want to say welcome, everybody. And we got a bunch of people in here from the creative multiverse already. They're in the chat, and you may not even know it. Jeremy, uh, we got uh, Dez, who, who does some amazing art. And we also have Native Graffiti, which is Michelle Alexander. We have a bunch of amazing people from the creative multiverse and from their own hap streams as well. Lindsay and myself do this thing. We call it, we, we, we stream, and we do art, and we talk, and we just have... We kind of do life together while we're drawing. It's pretty cool. Exactly. And uh, so if you want to join us and be a part of that, immediately after tonight's show, tonight's show is going to wrap up. And at 11 p.m. Eastern, we're going to go live on HAPS, and we're going to do the official PopX after show. Now, if you want to come and hang out with us and talk to yeah. us in real time after the show, you can hop up on camera. You can ask questions. You can do whatever. It's it's free to download. Check it out. It's uh, If you're on Google or on uh, iOS, it is HAPS. Dot TV, and if you're on, um, you're using your desktop or laptop, it is Haps TV as well. But just check us out. Come and join the Creative Multiverse, and come talk to Lindsay and myself. I know Austin's been busy cranking out videos like a boss the past uh, 24 hours, but um, come hang with us. We appreciate it. Yes, absolutely. That's all I got to say well, about that, Jenny. That's all he has to say about that. I got to say um, words. I believe Michelle Alexander, I know you mentioned her, she's at the movie theater right oh, now. Oh, snap. Getting ready to watch this movie. So she's like, I'll catch the replay later, Heck guys. Yeah. I've got to go, but I just wanted to send you some love. So we love her. I hope she enjoys the movie as much as we did. Aww. And um, I haven't introduced myself yet. So you you, you got to introduce yourself. I mean, you you, you got to do that. I'm yeah. Lindsay Badger. What's up, Lindsay Badger? Your favorite cool. geeky yoki. And I need to tell you about what you missed last week. Or not last week, last episode. Tell them, girl. Episode 125, we talked about Sweet Tooth. If you guys haven't seen the, oh. the, the Sweet Tooth series oh. on Netflix, if I remember correctly, um, that is a winner. You guys need to go check that out if you haven't. Also, we did the retro rewind of The, Be the Breakfast Club. Mm -hmm. Double win. That was a great episode. Both reviews were all we talked about when we even sprinkled in a little loki catch up oh, yeah. in that last episode so if you guys missed that make sure you go back and watch that you can check that out on the official website popxcast.com and you can watch all the other great past shows that we've done in the collective archive of popx goodness mm -hmm. yes i just love the it's good there. stuff there's some good nuggets in there all right so i like nuggets after tonight's show if you like what you've seen and you want more, uh -huh. make sure you click this lovely thumbs up button and the subscribe button and click the bell because that's how you get notified when we go live next. And we also schedule our shows in advance so you guys know when we're going to be live so that you can hang out in the chat and get geeky with us. Well, praise Jesus. I Every single that. time. Thank, Thank you, you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All right. All right. And for our podcast friend. Pass the offer. We love the podcast, friends. We love them dearly. We would like to ask you for a favor. Yes, oh. do, yes, give us a favor. Would you be so kind to give us a five-star rating and review of our podcast if you're enjoying what you're listening to? That would be amazing. If you do, Austin will come and tickle your backside. 
Well, I can't promise that, but if okay. he's up for I it. can. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, Lindsay, you nailed this oh, week's intro, girl. You are welcome. so awesome. I love it. I'm here all night. You're here all night. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, you ready for some news? Mm. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on? Oh my God. Extra, extra. Read all about it. This is Pop X News. Coming to you live right, right here, here on PopXCast.com. All righty, leading off the news, we got to get the bad out of the way first Ugh. so we can talk about the good stuff. But, you mm. know, one of my favorite directors and producers from the 80s specifically, he, he created so many amazing movies. Richard Donner, the legendary director and producer responsible for such icons as some of the first modern superhero movies as Superman, Christopher Reeve, Donning the Tights. Uh, for the first time, as well as Goonies. We just did a retro rewind we on did. the Goonies. It's and true. Um, that was all Richard Donner. It, with with Had a little bit of help from a couple of other producers that we might know along the way. We won't mention those guys right now, but he did pass away at age of 91. And he lived a, 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 a very fruitful life for that age. And Donner's breakout yeah. project was 1976's The Omen. Remember the little kid that would go around and... You know, to kind of do some weird stuff along the oh, way. Yeah. But, uh, is it called classic supernatural horror film? Uh, but just two years later, Donner directed Superman the movie. Now, this was a huge undertaking. I think it's one of the first times in production film history that they filmed two movies back to back to have uh, to have uh, releases one year after the other. So, Superman one and two is essentially one long film that Richard Donner had a part of. Now, uh, he did go on and help Christopher Reeve in starting the project. And in 2006, fans got to see Donner's original version of the project fully realized with the release of Superman 2, the Richard Donner cut. And nice. so this has almost, I would say like 25, maybe 30 minutes of additional footage that was never included in the cinematic release. And it's good because you get to see... Austin's zoning out. You're really zoning out. You're thinking about it hard. I can see that. I, I love. <laughs> I thought he was just fighting back tears. I think he's. I, I think he's about ready to <laughs> fart. Honestly, but <laughs> already <laughs> did. <laughs> Maybe mm. both. Anyway, I already did. He's he also founded right Donner's now. Company Production, uh, and he did such films as um, Any Given Sunday. 2000's X-Men, 2009's X-Men Origins Wolverine, this film company did. He also briefly dipped his toe into the world of comic books themselves, co-writing with Action Comics alongside his former assistant, Joff Johns. We all know that name. Donner and Johns most recently contributed to a story in 2018's anthology Action Comics 1000, which I think Austin may have had on his wall at one point. Yes. Um, uh, but not in the new studio, but you do have the comic. I know that much. So uh, it was cra crazy that part of Richard Donner's legacy is entangled in that comic. And But I, I want to say to Donner's family and anybody that's watching this, thank you for creating Superman. For me, was the first movie that introduced me into the world of superheroes as a young kid. And I will never Same. forget it. My dad would stay up all night on recorded on VHS from Turner Classic. Well, no, was it what was it? The Movie Channel at the time, TMC. Mm -hmm. And uh, he would record it for me, and then you know he would have to hurry and pop in another cassette because he didn't want to miss it because it was so long. Thank you so much, Richard Donner. Appreciate it. And I think from all of the fans around the world, the, the legacy that you created, the Goonies and Superman, and the Lethal Weapon franchise. I mean, the list goes on and on. Thank you, man. You will live on in history forever. We appreciate that. And uh, with that said, Austin Burke. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to move on from that. No, I, and it's a shame, too, because, you know, even at that age, I mean, he was still working, right? There were rumors of, of another lethal weapon with, with him as a producer. And it's just really, it's really impressive. And to, you know, live such a long and lengthy life, but also to have so much come from it. And he's one of the unsung unsung heroes when it comes to directors in Hollywood, because we look at his filmography and one third of them are classics. Yeah. I mean, just well-respected box office uh, winners, classics, right? Yeah. So that's impressive. And, you know, Donner, like we said, will be missed and, and a huge footprint in the uh, the comic book industry as well, which is really important for what we do here. But we're going to try to uh, turn the tides and go a bit more positive and talk about 
the box office, uh, oh. in which mm. I actually I just did a video on this, so it's kind of right down my we wheelhouse. We've been box fresh. office for a while. I kind of like wow, this. this is it's, a fresh it's turn. Weird. It and good. It's, and it's changing a bit as well, Lindsay. So after impressive uh, after impressive opening day at the box office, the Walt Disney Company reports that Marvel Studios Black Widow debuted to an estimated 218 million globally wow. over the weekend. Now. This total accounts for 80 million at the domestic box office, okay. 78 million from international markets. Now, here's the catch more than 60 million in Disney Plus Premier Access buy. That's, that's new. That's very, it's very new here. It's weird to add that to the total. But I have oh. a, little, a little thing I want to talk about here in just a second. We'll get into it. But uh, that makes Black Widow the highest domestic box office opening since the pandemic began. Wow. And since Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker opened in December 2019. Uh, if one accounts for the combined box office and Disney Plus premiere access totals, Black Widow is the first movie to surpass $100 million domestic in its opening weekend since the pandemic's start. Wow. So. I mean, goodness gracious, great numbers Holy all around. Cow. Now, here's one one of the kickers, though. A lot of people are kind of putting a damper on the fact that, you know, the Disney Plus opening kind of took away from the box office. But here's what I have to say about that. As long as it, A, doesn't destroy the theater industry, right. but B, according to what I know, and as much as I was able to research, Disney gets to keep almost 100% of the Disney Plus profits Whereas the theatrical box office gets a cut, the theaters get a cut and a lot of different portions taken out of that. Some goes to the, the studio, day. some yes. goes to the theater, exactly. distribution. Mm -hmm. yes. So there's a lot that goes into that. So I actually think this premier access route and doing as well as it did, if it didn't do that well, they wouldn't have released the numbers. That's the way it goes. But doing as well as it did was a huge win for Disney, even yeah. though if you just look at the box office, it's on the lower end of the MCU, but we're also coming off of a pandemic and yeah. it made more than Fast 9 domestically with the premier access. Fast Dang. 9 didn't have that. So I see this as a huge domestic win. Now, internationally, I think we'll have to boost those numbers, uh, numbers a some little bit. Some countries don't have, some, some countries haven't even released the full, it, you know, exactly, access yeah. to theaters yet. Well, yep, and, and, exactly. and is oh. Disney Plus international or is it U.S. only? It is, it is, I believe the majority of countries have it, but there are still some countries that, that do, do not, not and some countries that are restricted. So I'd have to look more into yeah. that. But yeah, 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 it's it's interesting when you look uh, at that. This is really wild for me, though, because for the first time I'm seeing a box office number with a Disney streaming platform included <laughs> into that. Yeah. Now, you know, I do know we are coming off the box office, but I kind of felt all right. So I've saw this film twice already. I saw Black okay. Widow on Thursday preview night. And mm -hmm. I went and took my wife and saw it. We both saw it last night. We had a great night. And it, she just laughed her butt off at, at Red Guardian. And it was a great time. And so we, here's, the, here's what I'm telling you that. I looked around and the theater was like half full. And it felt like, oh my God, we're yeah. back. Yeah. The smell of popcorn and soda and previews and the big screen and the sound system. I'm like, and the reclining seats and all of that. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, this is this ah. is what I've been missing for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And you said something really interesting in the in the statistic. Like I didn't even realize that the rise of Skywalker was December twenty nineteen. Little did I know that just a couple. What is it like two months later? Is when the pandemic started. Yeah, I'm just saying. Wait, wait a minute, twenty nineteen. It's crazy. And you don't even think about that. So I guess Rise mm -hmm. of Skywalker was the last major heavy hitting blockbuster film yeah. before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's gross. That is crazy, dude. That's anyway, gross. moving <laughs> moving along. <laughs> Lindsay Badger, what do you have for us? All right. Well, uh, speaking of the pandemic, thanks, pandemic. Thanks, pandemic. Um, <laughs> it's been officially <clears throat> two years since Netflix released new episodes of Stranger Things. Mm -hmm. I know it's a favorite episode, uh, series that, yes, that yes. we all know and love. Yeah. Um, fourth season is still currently in production. And the show stars have teased it's the best season yet. Mm. Uh, despise the long, despite, excuse me, despite the long wait for four seasons, uh, for season four, many people are wondering about the show's fifth mm. season. Boy, we just, we haven't even gotten yeah. the fourth one yet. Come on, calm down, everybody. Calm down. All right. 
It's not yet been officially confirmed, despite plenty of rumors. But during an interview with David Harbour, he was asked about these rumors and he did tease a little bit. He said, yeah, I think on my Netflix talking points list, I'm not supposed to say that there is a fifth season. (laughs) If you were on set with someone doing a show that possibly might have a fifth season, I'm sure that those people, if you were close to them, as as I am with the Duffer Brothers... (laughs) <laughs> would probably bring up things that might move forward into the next season. Oh my yeah. God, he's so silly. I love <laughs> David Harbour. Oh I am God. in love with David Harbour. <laughs> I love him, adore him. I love the characters he plays. He's awesome. And I love the way he plays around in his interviews. It's just oh. perfect. You couldn't have asked for a he, better He, he neither confirmed nor denied. <laughs> and he did it with a, uh, with a style. With a big fat wig. Yeah. <laughs> that is so awesome. Holy cow. <laughs> That is great. Uh, so I will say this much. I don't know if I shared these pictures, but um, I was on the film location set of Stranger Things season That's four right. mm-hmm. about trip. four weeks a weeks ago. I was in Jackson, Georgia, and I was in uh, the, the Jackson Square where they are filming some of the scenes. Uh, there's a warehouse and there's oh. also an old vintage Radio Shack. If you guys go back on my Instagram feed, you will see those images. Uh, so that was just four months ago, and, and I was talking to a friend of mine up there, and the, the scene is still heavily in production. Uh, there's a retro pizza joint that they made in the square. Um, I want to say cool. there's a couple of points of interest as well. I think there's a church there uh, where they are um, going to visit. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, they think that uh, that he's dead. Uh, what is his name? Um David Arbor's character. Help me out here. Yes. Popper. Popper. Yes. Pop. Uh, they think he's dead, so they're going to go have this mock-like celebration wake because he's not there. He's the sheriff of the town. Mm-hmm. And so the, the the church that they're using in that is in Jackson, Georgia as well. Got to see that. And so um, it's really wild being on the film set and you're seeing policemen on your right and you're just sitting there like this, you know, they're just watching you. Yeah. And you're on a hot set production that could literally, at any moment, the trucks roll up with the with the boom rigs and stuff and just start filming. Um, it's cool, though. Yeah, really cool. Amazing. I like being in Georgia. Awesome. I like being in Georgia when things are being in production. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So, But uh, that was cool. And we got more on David Harbour coming up later because Lindsay's got an insane fan theory that we can throw out <laughs> with you. Okay. All right. Last news in the segment of the week, and we're going to go into Retro Rewind. The journey of Peter Parker within the Marvel Cinematic Universe has been has seen him dealing with being dropped into the world of Avengers, looking up to Tony Stark as a mentor, while also battling against the likes of the Vulture Mysterio. But it seems as if the upcoming Disney Plus series, What If?, is looking to throw a giant curveball at the wall crawler that might be pulling from the classic comics. Now, with the latest poster for the series revealing a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man donning a cape, The new appearance might be pulling from an older issue of the comic series. Now, while at first glance, it might seem that Spider-Man is wearing a patent red cape of the Sorcerer Supreme Doctor Strange, the cape was also worn by the wall crawler in a classic What If comic titled, What If Spider-Man Had Never Become a Crime Fighter? Interesting. In the issue, we visit an alternate timeline in which a young Peter Parker decides to stop in the thief, stop the thief ultimately responsible for killing Uncle Ben, so he stops him before it happens, doing so strictly to boost his own popularity amongst the public following his wrestling debut. Now, with Uncle Ben now alive in this alternate reality and no tragic moment pushing him into crime fighting, Peter becomes so famous that he is even given the role of the most Host of The Tonight Show, while nothing has been confirmed regarding the story of Spider-Man in the upcoming animated series to land on Disney Plus this August, which is just weeks away, it's clear that the show is looking to make some major changes to the MCU via alternate universes, alternate timelines, which is being it's essentially bringing back some of the biggest names from the movies. And I will say this, if you saw the trailer this week that came out, you would have heard Chaswick Boseman's last reprisal of T'Challa, uh, the king of Wakanda, which was very heartfelt. When I heard that, I just kind of had a somber moment. I was like, oh. But his legacy lives on. Wakanda and forever. so, yeah, exactly, Wakanda <laughs> forever. And so uh, it's really cool, though. The What If series 
basically is through the eyes of a watcher. We saw the watchers in Guardians of the Galaxy, right? We know who they are. We know that they don't really interact with any of the beings in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. We just know that they observe from afar. That's all that they do. And so through the eyes of the Watcher, we are able to see these alternate realities and timelines unfold, giving our heroes like, you know, you had Captain Carter, which was interesting. You also have some very interesting mashups. You also have the zombie timeline, which we saw a preview of that as well. So there's a lot of things to unpack here. I ain't... I'm very fortunate. I have about 10 of the original 80s What If comics setting in my room in my man cave, and they're pretty awesome. What if, this was an interesting one, what if Wolverine killed the Hulk? Oh. That was the 50th anniversary issue of What If, and it was a foil cover, if I recall. Uh, so it was kind of a big thing, but like we, everybody thought like, the Hulk is indivincible. What happened? What would happen if he actually? It was easy. It was crazy. It's time to pull those out of the box and do a little I'm flip. I'm telling through. you, it, it is. I mean, I may actually own a comic that they're going to feature one of the episodes on. So that'd be kind of cool to 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 unpack that and look exactly. at it. But uh, so I'm that. excited for for What If series, man. I, it's just really awesome. Disney just keeps rolling this out. Right after Loki, we've got. We got What If. Right after What If, we got Shang-Chi. Right after Shang-Chi, we, it just boom, 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 boom. Yes, please. It's crazy. Yes, thank you. Yeah. I'm a nerd nuggets. <laughs> uh, oh, my gosh. Are you guys ready for some retro rewind? Oh, bring it. Oh, my gosh. I rewind, have been. Rewind. I, oh, my gosh. I have been literally chomping at the bit for this all day long. Let's do it now. The retro rewind. Retro Rewind. Retro Rewind. We are visiting 1980s fours. Oh my God. This is awesome. It's Ghostbusters. Who are you going to call? I think you have a little Ghostbusters on your shoulders there, Joe. I, I do. You see here, I got to. Uh, that Shoot. Slimer, I got, Stay Puff. I got Stay Puff. Yeah. Ghost and then I've guy. got, uh, well, this is from Halloween Horror Nights, actually. Yeah. So there's Slimer right there. I've got oh. Slimer. And I've got Mortal Kombat, Blue Man Group. And the, it actually says Halloween Horror Nights on it. Mm -hmm. Then over here, Stay Puffed and the Ghostbuster symbol. So, huh. yes, yeah. I am a, I thought I had more than that on here. I may have. I may, oh, uh, I got a Ghostbusters uh, thing on the back. <laughs> He looks yeah. like a little boy scout with all his patches. Thank I earned you. this one here. And I, <laughs> I, got, over I here. earned this and one my, in and Detroit. I tried not when to I, get this one. <laughs> I, got, I, got, I got Robocop right here. Can you see? Oh, that? sweet. Okay, Robocop. That's anyway. rad. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Moving on. Ghostbusters. You're more than allowed to. Um, <laughs> this is, we're going to spend some time on this because we're not going to be talking Loki as much this week. Mm -hmm. So we're going to only focus on Black Widow and Ghostbusters. So we're going to allow a little more time on these two. Um, my God, I remember watching this. It came out in 84 and it hit VHS stores. You guys know what that is? What? You guys know, do you guys know what a, a video rental store is? What is that? <laughs> it's when you go down to your mom and pop place, usually connected to a gas station, and you <laughs> take the little tab off the thing where the box art is and you take it up to the counter. It's like, all right, that'll be $1.25. Was this in person? It was in person. Wow. Yeah, you had to go. Red box crap. Oh, my gosh. So, anyway, <laughs> I remember my dad bringing this home on a Saturday night. And he's like, we got to watch this movie, bub. And I'm like, okay, let's do it. <laughs> let's go. And let's go. I was sitting here. I was definitely addicted to Ghostbusters right <laughs> off the bat. I mean, this, I mean, you got to imagine, dude. I'm like, this is 84. What is this? Winter of 84. It came out in June. Yeah. And um, and so it was like right right at the holidays. We dad had just got a VHS tape player, <laughs> you, know, you, you know. So we're like top of the line. We're like above, you know, keeping up with with the Joneses. We, you know, we, we kind of had our first family VHS digital recorder. So we thought we were gonna pop the collar. You know, we are the Burks and we we're in the house. Oh, fancy. And so he's like, hey, that was a. I you know what I think that was the first movie my dad ever rented on that thing. I, wow. I believe it was. Right. I believe it was because he got it that Christmas and he rented the movie the next week. Interesting. Nice. So anyway, long story short, I'm extremely excited to talk about this. Can you tell? Oh, my God. Uh, well, let's so, start then. <laughs> <laughs> Ghostbusters, um, man, it was – I watch this movie about once a year, realistically. I do. It's one of those movies I'll pop on. 
when I'm doing art or something in the background and I always will have it on, but I always do make an attempt to watch it every single time it's either on TV or something like that. Or if friends are over, it's always a feel good movie because you know, you're going to get some laughs out of it. And, uh, it's just one of those things that when I see it and I hear it, I can literally hear five seconds of this film and know it's exactly that's Ghostbusters. You could just hear the soundtrack, you know, the, the eeriness, you know, and I just know exactly that this is a good time. And it takes me back to a good time. The 80s was very good to me. And uh, as a time where you're carefree, you're young, you're growing up, and you're living vicariously through the eyes of Venkman, Spangler, and uh, the whole crew. And this is a great time. And I'm going to shut up now, and I'm going to let Lindsay Badger take over, then Austin Burke, because <laughs> I can go on and on and on, and I'm not going to do that. Oh my gosh. Okay. So this movie screams 80s um, <laughs> through its music, through its wardrobe, through its hairstyles, through the vehicles you see, because you were literally in the heartbeat of New York City the majority of the time. Yep. So you are definitely getting a very full spoonful of 80s goodness. Oh, yeah. Right off the bat. Whenever Joe was mentioning about the music, there is that opening song that just sucks you <laughs> right in. And then it takes you into the opening scene and they waste no time showing you ghosts. You go right into that big library and you see all the spooky things and there's slime and screaming librarians. And it's just like, OK, yeah. I'm on board. And like the first five minutes, you're already pumped and ready to go. Oh, yeah. And then you start getting introduced to these goofy guys that are trying to be experts, but they're not at all. They're you, they're flying by the seat of their pants the entire time. <laughs> but, you know, it's almost like a, a, a con the entire time, but it's Kinda. actually legit in its yeah. own way. And um, the, the special effects are mostly not cgi they're like you know the fishing wire is moving the books across the, the aisle and you know the it's yeah. like old school special effects and Practical. i think that's the reason yeah. i like it and it's still a, gonna be a class movie it's just like why i think it's the reason why i love all the jim henson's movies is mm. because it's mostly practical real effects. props real people real yeah. tangible things that artists actually spent tons of hours putting together and making it work the 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 special effect that stood out to me the most is when she's sitting in the chair and the spins and then it sucks her through the door mm. you can actually if you look closely the flooring is tile and the lining of tile lines up just close enough for a little rod to run down the rail but you have to look for it mm. and so i was just like okay I'm like seeing these things now that I never saw before. Whenever I was watching it today, I was like, wow, this is like the coolest stuff in the, in the, the frying eggs popping out of the, the eggshell and all the stuff and the, in the, the, the statues that crumble and, you know, you have the hands coming out, oh, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. It just blows my mind. And of course, you know, the safe up marshmallow man is like the grand finale of the show and yeah. everybody gets turned into a human s'more that is amazing, exciting stuff when you're a kid. It is. That is like mind blowing. Who in the right mind would even envision a <laughs> giant Godzilla sized man made out of marshmallows? Stance would. He's <laughs> of like, of course a, he would. I only imagined the most purest thing growing up as a kid. <laughs> and then somebody the had puff the idea of, man. like, you know, guys, when I'm at the campfire and I make a s'more. I just shoved that marshmallow right in the fire and set it aflame. That's exactly what they did. They lit that sucker on fire while he was climbing up the, the thing, and then they zap him, and he explodes into this huge mallow puff confetti goodness. I want to swim in it, honestly. It's so crazy. <laughs> yeah. The thing that was a, a little over the top for me is whenever the streets crumbled right before they, the, when they got out of the car. Oh, yeah. And they about to go in the building, and all those streets kind of that was like yeah that now that was so very and they, much and they crawled out of it unscathed because it was so slow like yeah. the way it moved it was very mechanical and not like yeah not realistic it was kind of wonky yeah i get you on yeah that i was like how did the people fall deep down into the cracks but the police car only went halfway in you know i'm curious <laughs> to know how they filmed that scene because i mean 
you think about it hypothetically, they had to use some major props, and they had to build that probably above the already existing street. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious how they did that. That's a really good point. I mean, there's so many small details that I could pick out. But those are just some of the bigger moments for me that oh, yeah. really stood out as like, I mean, I love the storytelling. They develop the characters really well. There is a beginning, a middle and an end that's very follow it. You follow it through. It's not really lost and gone all over the place. Um, everybody go- played their roles perfectly. In my yeah. opinion, I don't think there was anybody that was like not believable. True. So, yeah, well, I, I mean, mean, they have overall, some heavy hitters it's, it's on a here. Winner. Like Rick Rick Moranis, Sigourney oh, gosh, Weaver. Rick is amazing. Oh, my God. Are you the gatekeeper? Hey, oh, you your taxes. I'm the key master. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> Sorry, I know I pulled out some random stuff that no, I wanted you to didn't. leave some, some meat for you guys to but, chew on, too. Randomness is good, though, because yeah. you're, you're, you're pulling things from your perspective that normally we wouldn't pull. So that's mm-hmm. awesome. And so you were talking about the writing. I mean, Harold Ramis and Dan Aykroyd. Yeah. Come Beautiful. on. I mean, you know, long live Harold Ramis. God bless him. Rest in peace, sir. Uh, pretty much he was almost like Donner. Uh, in, in a lot of ways, he wrote half of my childhood. Yeah. Harold Ramis wrote some of the greatest comedies in the 80s that ever existed. Stripes. I mean, yeah. mm-hmm. let me just keep going on. And um, it's a great film, actually. And, and I love everything about it. I want to go to the critic. What is up? How do you feel about 84's Ghostbusters? I, I feel like, you know, we've been doing these movies and, and one of these days I've just got to, you know, lock on and slap one of these movies around and say, I don't care if it's a classic. I don't like it, but it's not going to be this one. I, <laughs> it's not going to be this you one. Thank God. That. We keep we keep picking just some of the most classic classics but some of these movies that you just watch and there's this ridiculous sense of joy and yes. just your entertainment i think a lot of this starts with well, obviously ivan reitman who i think did a wonderful job directing this movie and of course like you said joe you know two of the greatest comedic writers of the 80s and two of the funniest people of the 80s and that entire period uh, they wrote this movie and they injected their sense of humor into it but Beyond that, I mean, Bill Murray uh, is incredible yes. in this film. Uh, oh, Rick Rick Moranis, amazing. like you said, Lindsay, one of my favorite comedic, just awkward, quirky, silly performances of the 80s. And every time he's on screen, it's, it feels like he steals the entire show. Honey, I Shrunk and, the Kids. Oh, oh yeah. Honey, so I Shrunk good. the Kids. And, and one of my favorites of all time, Spaceballs. I mean, this guy was just a comedy. Oh. Dude, Dark comedy. helmet. <laughs> oh, he was so good. And and everyone's firing on all cylinders in this movie. And the, it really is like an 80s all-star cast. I mean, beyond the guys, right? Mm-hmm. Sigourney freaking Weaver. I, oh, I mean, she, she just came off so of Alien, pretty. too. Yes. Just I mean, came off of Alien. Back to back. This is It's ridiculous, the, the career that this entire cast had. Uh, and even Ernie Hudson. I mean, Ernie Hudson is great. Everyone's really good. But it's that that silly mentality of, I mean, the, the villains... On the outside looking in, they're ridiculous, right? But they play it up so well in this movie, and there's such a good origin story for each of our villainous characters, like Slimer, and and you believe it. As Mm -hmm. silly as it gets, you believe it. And I think that's what makes this movie special. Now, kind of going off of what Lindsay said, I do think there were a few moments that were a bit too unbelievable. Uh, She brought up a great example. A couple of moments towards the end. um, Some things that maybe I would have done differently in the finale but it doesn't really take away from the impact and it doesn't take away from the uh, my favorite part of the film. And that is the, the humor. Yeah. You are laughing yeah. constantly. And there was nothing like this in the 80s. Yeah. No other movie captured this magic. And it kind of kind of like what Jaws did, this fear of sharks. Jaws played it a, a lot more serious, of course. But this movie plays on your fear of ghosts. And even though you're laughing the whole time, we're all kind of sitting back, especially when it came out in the 80s. Everybody was kind of sitting back going, you know, chills down your arms and like, man, I, I don't like I don't like the feeling you get when you're watching people fight ghosts. And it, mm. it almost gives you this fear while you're watching it. Like these ghosts could be real. Yeah. And to balance humor and that along with action and adventure and a little bit of drama in there, some serious moments. 
man, this movie has a beautiful balance of all of that. And yeah. uh, I was really able to kind of lock in on that this time around when I watched it with my wife. We both had a great time. Uh, and I wouldn't consider it one of my defining 80s movies personally. This was probably only my fourth time seeing it. Fourth time. That's still a lot. Um, but I, I, I love it every time I watch it. Uh, and it's one of those movies that does resonate. And I'm super pumped for the new movie coming out. Y'all excited? Because I'm excited. Afterlife is going to be... And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to start this series now, because I wanted yeah. to go like mid-year, yeah. let's start Ghostbusters, Halloween, let's do part two, and that'll lead yep. us into another few months down the road, Afterlife. Yeah. And so Perfect. we can do the entire legacy uh, mm -hmm. of the Ghostbusters franchise, with the exception of the reboot that came out a couple years ago. We're not going to talk not, about that one, though. Not great. Yeah. Not good. Um, but I do want to kind of touch base on a couple really cool small points. Uh, and before, I have a bullet point list here that I'm going to tell you. Some strange facts about Ghostbusters you didn't know. But before I get into that, I'm going to tell you a little history backstory of Ghostbusters. And this is why some of the effects and why some of the things, uh, like one, one of the things that Lindsay was talking about, the, 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 the scene with the asphalt cracking. Yes. Um, so get this. Reitman approached the studio May 1983 and pitched okay. the studio. And Reitman told the studio, I have Aykroyd, Ramus, and Murray. And the studio's like, Already coming off of Stripes, those three was already in there. And they wanted to cast John Candy. John Candy was actually going to be Rick Moranis' role. Oh. Didn't know that, did you? Nice. And so um, pulling out of that, uh, the studios like came back and said, okay, how much do you need? And Reitman said, $30 million. Well, the studio immediately approved it because the name's already on the bill. <laughs> they was like, all right, you could do this movie in $30 million. Here's the catch. you got to have it out by June. Dun, dun, dun. That's exactly. a, that's a now we're talking June the next year. That's so insane. they only had three months. So it got approved in like around the end of June for the studio. Production started between July and October. Production began in October of 1983. And this movie had to be done with all the effects ready for previews the first week of June. That's a duck um, wire movie. <laughs> Joe, the fact that they made it work, though, because we hear those stories all the time, most of the yeah. time, the movies with failures. They made it work. Mm -hmm. they did. That's one of the most incredible parts about it. And here's another crazy thing that a lot of people don't know. Most of Bill Murray's lines are 100% improvisa improvisation. <laughs> he went off the script. Like the one scene, like, we came, we saw, we kicked its ass. <laughs> it's totally, uh, that's totally Bill Murray being Bill Murray. I, and I he's like, you know, he's like cats and dogs, you know, all that stuff. And when he was together talking to Mayor, in harmony, yeah, all yeah that stuff. that's all improv. And okay. everything pretty much, I would say, half of Bill Murray's lines, with the exception of the lines that had to per pertain to the story. Mm -hmm. Oh, him hitting the keys like the ghost, they hate that improv. And so it was all crazy. But I, before we give our score, I'm going to give you uh, some pretty cool stuff here that you may not know about Ghostbusters. This is something I want to start doing on the Retro Rewind. We're not just going to talk about it and rate it. We're going to give you some tidbits about it along the way. Uh, Dan Aykroyd found inspiration for the movie from his own family's backstory. Now, let me mm -hmm. tell you about that. Dan Aykroyd's family was huge into the paranormal, and he had some paranormal experiences growing up as a kid himself. So they were into, you know, the conjuring of spirits and things like that and, and holding seances and doing all of this. So Dan Aykroyd was kind of familiar with that. And so that's where he was able to pull a lot of this stuff that is in the film. Second up, it's, John Belushi. Sorry, just real quick. It's yeah. perfect that he he gets to play the role that he does in this movie because his character is so very technical. Yeah. And talks about the physics and the science mostly about what the ghosts are doing and why they're interacting and yeah. what this is. Ectoplasm. And, so and, and just, he the, just kind of settled into that role very well because of his experience. In yeah. Real life. Even, even some of the meters that they use, even though they're, they're Holly Hollywooded up a little bit, but PKE meters are a real thing that you use to get, to gauge electromagnetic fields. I know this kind of stuff. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. But now John Belushi still appears in the final film, but only in spirit. The reason I tell you that. He was supposed to be Peter Venkman. John Belushi, on the original script, had had Belushi down for Bill Murray's role. John Belushi died, you know, of course, at the end, uh, right around that time. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that, well, actually, Bill Murray came in and nailed the role and did it justice. Perfect. But he's there in spirit because some of those lines were actually supposed to be John Belushi. Uh, so d here's another one. Director Ivan Reitman 
made a couple of unorthodox appearances in the movie. Can anybody guess what? He was the voice of Slimer. Yes, that <laughs> sound. That's <laughs> Alan Reitman. That's Ivan Reitman. And also, when Dana Barrett is possessed by Zool, uh, you know, Dana. you know when she <laughs> when she when she looks at Bill Murray's There's character and is like, Zool. "There is no Dana, only Zool." That's actually uh, Ivan Reitman. That's uh, impressive. Next one is about Ecto. We got to talk about the Ecto Mobile. It was one of a kind. And it was the only one, and then it broke down. Long story, because of production, you know, think Back to the Future. Back to the Future had like mm -hmm. three or four DeLoreans on the set that they could use and interchange for various scenes. Yes. They could only get one Ecto because Ecto was so intricate in which the way it was constructed with all the pipes and tubing and lights and all this. A funny story, on one of the scenes where they're going across the bridge, I think it's the Brooklyn Bridge, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in that scene, and which... It was one of the final scenes they shot. It breaks down and it dies permanently Done. dead on arrival. And so the scene where they're going across the bridge, what you don't see if they were show you the X of it was actually it coming to a stop and the entire engine being just totally ruined. But yes, that is a hearse from, uh, I think it's 1957, 1956 hearse yeah. or something like that. Cadillac hearse. But uh, it was one of a kind and it was totally ditched after the film. So wow. the Ecto that's in Ghostbusters 2 was a total refabrication because now they had the proper funding and they could do it the way they wanted to do it. Uh, two more they, things. They turned that the back end of the hearse. They had the rack that pulled out that had all of their oh, packs. Oh, all like, the proton packs yeah. in it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The proton packs sitting in the row. Two more hits. We were talking about Sigourney Weaver earlier. In her original audition, when she came into audition in front of Ivan Reitman, she didn't speak a word. And they, get, they call this one of the strangest auditions in Hollywood history. She came in and began doing the dog-like uh, poses of Zool, the demon dog. And she didn't say huh. a word. She looked into the camera and just started snarling and growling and doing these like really crazy alien-like sounds and stuff like that. She done her part and walked off, and that was it. True story. <laughs> Uh, last but not least, this is one I noticed today, and I've never seen this mentioned on the internet anywhere. So this is a PopX Ghostbusters factoid preview, a debut right here. Okay. All right. So I'm watching at the scene where Dana Barrett's coming out of the concert hall, and you have the big fountain, the round fountain, and you got the cityscape in the background, and uh, Peter Venkman, Bill Murray's character, is doing the, the leg skip across the, the the front of the thing, and they're having a discussion. Well, in the background, I noticed something today I never noticed before. The uh, U.S. flag and the flags behind it are at half staff. And I'm sitting here like, wait, why is the city and the nation on some kind of – weird half staff thing during 1983 which would have been end of october 1st of november when this happened when they were filming there in manhattan and i couldn't find anything i was like what is going on here so i found when they started doing the actual production film shoots in manhattan because this is a cross between los angeles and new york is where they split the two uh, areas of filming Come to find out, there was a gruesome uh, battle that took place in Beirut where some French soldiers were brutally massacred. Brutally massacred. And Ronald Reagan, the president at the time, felt very heartfelt about this because France is an ally of the United States. And he's like, in honor of our ally France, we're going to have all, all flags at half staff for this season. Just so happens, if you go back and watch that scene, the flag is certainly at half staff. In honor of the fallen soldiers in the in the French um, army uh, who were who were massacred and murdered in Beirut, so interesting little tidbit for you there. Some history kind of overlining with the film production of Ghostbusters. Interesting, right? Mm, it's interesting Great. indeed. I yeah. loved it. So anyway, uh, we're going to rate the film, and we're going to start with Lindsay Austin and then myself, Lindsay Badger. Well, as we are already know, um, this movie was taken by storm the crowds all loved it and there was there was at least for the children mass hysteria of getting their clamoring to get their hands on all the the merch they could possibly manage my brother was one of them mm -hmm. uh i i yeah he he wanted all the the things and he, you know birthday cakes costumes for halloween i mean it wasn't just like for a month it was like years 
of Ghostbuster madness oh, in yeah. my house. Oh, yeah. So um, I grew up watching this a gajillion times. I could probably quote it in my sleep if I tried. Um, and I personally enjoy it just as much as he did, I think. Um, I'm going to go with a 9.2 Holy as cow. my score. Nice. Wow. Uh, because there, though the, the aging process is, has, you know, held up it still shows its age uh it, but it, there's not a lot to pick at it's really it's not perfect but it's a solid movie yeah i couldn't agree more Lindsay. thank you so much austin burke yes i'm going in 8.2 in 82 percent. i think it's a, a a great movie a movie that I, I i feel like i wanted to watch more as a kid growing up i just didn't you know it's it's one of those that every time i watch i'm like yes but i didn't get to watch it that often but man did we have a great time watching it earlier today 8.2 for me oh man well uh, for me i'm gonna go with a 9.2 and uh i was definitely caught up in the 80s hysteria i was caught up in i wanted i wanted the proton pack and i wanted to get the ecto one toy and i um at one point i even owned um the ghostbusters play playhouse playset if you can believe it but there's one thing um now my my cohorts here on 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 the stream won't be able to see this but my mother, all right, so the film came out in 84. My birthday was in November of the same year, right before Dad got that VHS for Christmas. Oh, yeah. Mom got me a Ghostbusters birthday cake. Check this out, guys. So there's a young Joe Burke. Now, you guys, are, Mom. you have to look at the stream, Austin and Lindsay. Yeah. But okay. um, so here is uh, a young Joe. I'm probably, this is, this is winter of 84. I'm maybe five years old in this picture. And of course, my dad and, and I celebrate, uh, our birthdays are very close in November. And so we had a joint birthday cake. Oh. But as you can tell, uh, we had, this is, this is a cake straight out of 84, ladies oh. and gentlemen. And there's a young Joe <laughs> being a total retro nerd doing what I do best. Yeah. Look how big that smile is. Oh my oh, God, yeah. you have no idea. <laughs> and I pulled this one from the archive because I just wanted to show you guys how big of a Ghostbusters Those nerd cheeks, I was. Though. As I know, right? Oh, oh, my, you, you stop it right now. So you stop it. Okay, continue. <laughs> 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 but I had to show oh that. I had gosh. to show that. Oh my gosh, that was so uh, so awesome. So we got we got a nine point two. We got an eight point. What was yours, Austin? Eight point two. Eight point two. And then Lindsay's was a nine point. Yeah, nine point two. Nine point two. We both had the same. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. I had to go. So we're twinning, Lindsay. Yay! Lindsay. All right, that's awesome. Were well, you guys ready to discuss some Black Widow? Let's oh, throw yeah. down some Widow. All right, uh, don't go anywhere, guys. We got Black Widow coming up. This is going to be a spoiler heavy discussion. If you've not watched Black Widow. Uh, please hit pause button right now. Go enjoy the film and come back and enjoy Pop X Cast. We'll be right back. Danger, danger. You are about to enter a Pop, Pop, Pop X spoiler alert. Beyond this point, there is no return. You have been warned. You have been warned. And uh, so we're talking Black Widow now. As we said earlier in the news, we're coming out of the pandemic. This is the first big major blockbuster aside from F9. And uh, I'm telling you, we uh, we are very blessed and fortunate to finally have the release of Black Widow now in the theaters. And it was awesome. I have to say, man, this was a fun ride. Yeah, there's a lot of I, there was one of those films that's not perfect. And I, I have a couple of qualms with it. Um for me, uh, definitely, uh, I'm not going to talk about the qualms just yet, but I want to talk about some of the highlights. Definitely the highlights with me, David Harbour as Red Guardian. I mean, oh, yeah. he, I think his comedic uh, banter er, within the movie was not only relevant, it wasn't like that weird comedy, like he says a couple of lines, nobody said, laughs in the audience. His lines were actually genuinely really funny. And he just kind of shows, he's, he's totally clueless about everything around him. You know, his, his character's like, he has no idea. He's like, Definitely. I don't have inner peace. What? is <laughs> so good, dude. And uh, I enjoyed that. And I definitely enjoyed the, the banter and the interaction between Natasha and her sister. I, I really enjoyed that and just how her sister was like, uh, you're a poser. I mean, you do the thing and you flip the hair back. I love that. You know, mm -hmm. kind of, kind of uh, playing on Scarlett Johansson's, you know, actions and moves and the heroes and stuff. And, and uh, there's some heavy moments and there's some very dark moments. Surprisingly, there's a lot of heart in this film. And that was the one thing um, that was probably the biggest thing for me was 
just the overall heart of the film is truly amazing uh, from beginning to end. And you're seeing a story that is not necessarily kind of, you know, for the faint of heart. I mean, these girls were taken and basically it's human trafficking, sterilized at a young age and essentially brainwashed and programmed to do a certain task and a certain thing. And that was their entire life is to live under this one guy's rule. Pretty dark when you think about it. <laughs> um, but uh, I want to get a female perspective on the Black Widow. So I want to I want to go over to my cohort, Lindsay Badger. Okay. Um, yeah. Just warning you, there's going to be a bedtime alarm going off while I'm talking. So just ignore that. All right. Do, <laughs> we, do we need to go to sleep? Yeah, no, we don't need to. It's the children's alarm. It's a thing. The children. So, um, you know, I like kids. Where's the kitties at? Okay, go ahead. Sorry. So, anyways, um, my husband and I went on a date night last night, and we got to watch the last showing in the IMAX theater, which was Ooh, fantastic. Oh, yeah. There was actually a good amount of people in there for being so late. It started nice. at like 11. Anyways, so um, the opening scene all the way when they're they're the kids i think honestly that part mm. is my favorite part of the whole movie i, think yeah. I agree yeah. I, I couldn't when agree the, more. they were both little girls honestly i didn't know that they were both little girls <laughs> because just because of the way um her hair was dyed and cut and oh, the way yeah. she was dressed it was very um masculine in style and so i at first i really was confused about that i was like why do they keep saying two girls that's a boy and i was like wait never mind it isn't <laughs> carry on that's Living. just me being silly so um anyway so i really enjoyed that family environment it was very believable hmm. they sold it to me i was hook line and sinker yeah that's what the, the term is anyways um i was sold on that that dynamic for yeah. sure. I would have never known in a million years that they were two spies not married and that they weren't their own kids because of the love and the connection that those four people had with each other. Mm -hmm. And then the tables flip. Oh yeah. And you are just like, wait a minute, what is happening here? My whole world is about to get flipped upside down. And then they start diving into the, the, how they process the girls and everything. And I was the mom yeah. feels the mom feels started kicking in and i'm telling you what if a marvel movie can make me cry in the first 10 minutes there is something it happening. was horrible brutal man yeah. i was like tears streaming down my face over here and i'm like yeah, i mean we are still showing opening credits there are still people being credited for this movie and i'm already crying what yeah. is going on here? It was very, very heartfelt and, yeah. and very well put together little video montage of how they create these black killers widows, at widows. such a young age. These these black widow army of sorts. It's very, very sad. Um, and so once we get into adulthood, where we're following Natasha and we're starting to create this timeline. You know, they've we've, we've figured out that she's right after the Civil War right where they're Civil picking War. up the storyline. And so yeah. they've got this whole weird, awkward team breakup dynamic. Sokovia Accords and all that yeah, stuff. And, and she's like this fugitive running away from the U.S. government and this whole thing going on. And so th that's where it kind of I was following it for a while, but then it started kind of getting a little bit stagnant for me. Mm -hmm. And then... um we meet sister. Sister is a firecracker. Yeah. Samantha, right? I believe her name is. Is that right? Uh, is her name I, Samantha? Alias? Sure. Alias? Sure. Haley? Samantha? I don't remember. Anyway. <laughs> her name was Barbara. Yes. The, the, the little sister. We'll call I her Barb. loved her. I loved her dynamic. She brought a little bit of life back into the movie Yelena. for me. Mm -hmm. Yelena? Yelena. Okay, thank you. I'm horrible with things. You guys You're very welcome. Mother Russia says so hello to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so um, I loved how they teamed up and they broke dad out of jail and they're getting yeah. the family back together. The whole jail scene was hilarious. Oh, my God. That's where the comedy started in this yeah. movie for well, me. Well, yeah. David Harbour. I mean. <laughs> yeah, right. David Harbour was brilliant in this movie. I loved, loved, loved his entire, like, dumb brute strength 
little bit selfish, only cared about himself sort of yeah. vibe that he was going on. I wish it was a little, but towards the end of the movie, he kind of shifted just a little bit. Just mm. do, 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 do. So, um, I don't know. And then the end, let me, let me tell you what my husband asked me when we left the movie theater. Okay. Let me tell you how the final act was for him. Okay. Did Michael Bay direct this movie? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, damn, burn. Okay, so I, I do not disagree with him. Uh, there was a lot of spinning. There was a lot of flying. There was a lot of window panes being It kind of did feel like Transformers, didn't it? It did. It felt like Transformers when that thing was falling out of the sky. I am not kidding you. It, I was not sold. Yeah. In the final act, and there was a but lot. The of, rest of it was amazing. I echo what you said there, Lindsay. Though I mean, everything building up, and I think the third act uh, kind of did fall flat for me. Sorry, um, I know we were supposed to be sticking to positives. But no, that no, was no, just no. My overarching no, you, feelings. It, it's <laughs> no. We're we're getting out your first impressions right here on the stream. So that. Your first impression is your is your most accurate way you feel about the stream, yeah. uh, the film rather. Um, but I want to go to Austin um, now because I know he's got some perspectives about it too. I mean, I don't know if I should go before Austin or if Austin should go before me because I kind of feel even touch on Timekeeper or Melinda. Oh, I mean, we're, we're going to touch on them. We're going to talk about. <laughs> I'm going to be talking about uh, Taskmaster for sure. Oh um, yeah, um, Taskmaster. That's right. Yeah. So, Austin, I'm going to let you have it. I'm pretty sure that some of our viewpoints may overlap, though, but Probably. I want you to, yeah. Well, first off, I just got, uh, I just got my screener for Masters of the Universe just now. I got, uh, I got an email. So, oh, my God. we got to talk about that on PopXCast. I'm so excited. But beyond that, I have only seen Black Widow once, and I didn't see it in the theater. I got a digital screener. So that's kind of, I, I really want to see this on the big screen, okay? On the biggest and baddest screen possible. I saw F9, Fast 9, and IMAX. F9. And it, and it made it kind of bad. Otherwise, I think it would have been terrible. Anyway, I really, really liked Black Widow. I really liked it. The third act, kind of what Lindsay talked about, kept me from loving it. Yeah. And I think that's because this movie works best when it's very personal, subdued, and emotional. Yeah. And that's really what the first two acts consist of. I thought they were beautifully put together, weaved phenomenally. Florence Pugh is a superstar, and she went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Scarlett Johansson multiple times. And spoilers, um, <laughs> she will be a version, very different version, but... Marvel's new Black Widow. Essentially, yep. she is kind of taking over that role, oh, yeah. and I can't wait to see what they do and how she um, complements the team that they're forming, and we'll talk about that, uh, oh, yeah. I'm sure, soon. And but when they were able to bounce off of each other and that spy espionage feel, and it's so close to it, but they even reference at one point James Bond. Oh, this yeah. is Jason Moonraker. Born. She yes. was watching Moonraker. Yes, she in the was watching, it was on the screen, wasn't yeah. it? She was yeah. watching it on the screen. It definitely has that feel, that vibe yeah. for sure. It, it really does. And then a little bit of Mission Impossible in there, too, because I know she did this in Winter Soldier, but when they take the face off at the end, I'm like, okay, so we've got like every spy genre going on. And I'm okay with that, right? Winter Soldier is one of my favorite Marvel movies. And the fact that this really did feel like that uh, through the first th two acts. And honestly, if we think back to Winter Soldier, the final act of Winter Soldier is full of big explosions. Right. And that's kind of what Black Widow is, too. The difference is, for me at least, the difference is there was more of an emotional and personal touch to the end of Winter Soldier because we had what was going on with Robert Redford's character and Nick Fury. But we also had that attachment, that prior attachment to Bucky. Yeah. Taskmaster, we did not have that. No. So... When you get that reveal and you get the revelations with Taskmaster and all of those things, it was still emotional. It was. And it was heartbreaking what had happened. But that was the first time we had seen that character. So we didn't have the same attachment to Taskmaster that we did the Winter Soldier. And that was the difference for me. I cared when we saw that Winter Soldier was Bucky. I didn't really care as much when we saw who Taskmaster actually was. And a lot of that, too, was the predictability. I, I predicted it was going to be his daughter. I predicted that was going to be the case. And they made it very evident at a point. And I wish they kind of would have held that from us more so. And I know this sounds like a very negative thing. I still really, really enjoyed this movie. 
And I thought it's it held some of the best action, best choreography, and really best one-on-one dialogue that we've seen because I love a good family story. Oh, yeah. And Lindsay, I think, hit the nail on the head. It really did feel like a family. And while Rachel Weiss didn't necessarily stand out, I thought David Harbour and Florence Pugh provided two of my favorite characters to come recently from the MCU. And there is so much we yeah. could do with them going forward. Oh, yeah. Especially Florence Pugh. But man, give me a Red Guardian spinoff. Give oh, me my gosh. a little bit of that backstory with his despise for Captain America and and show us, you know, how powerful he really is. Cause I don't think we got to see how powerful the guy really is, man. I love all of the lore that we got from this movie, and I love a lot of things about it. I just didn't love the overall product, but I still thought it was a really good entry in the MCU. I agree. You know, for me, um, yeah, everything I'm echoing everything you guys said because that's one of the reasons I wanted to go last so I can figure out a couple of things that I wanted oh, to yeah. say at the end. Um, I, I the first the for opening act and the second act was just really solid for me, like yeah. it was really concrete. And there was a the third act was so like heavy on the CGI and the explosions and the red room falling down and all of that going on in the background and you lost some of the heart between why Black Widow was doing what she was doing. And it was just seemed like there's a lot of things that they tried to put into that final scene. Yeah. And it wasn't as well defined. Now, I do want to talk about Taskmaster. Oh, my God. I was very disappointed in the reveal. I was disappointed in in, in that because uh, it's definitely not in Marvel Comics canon. Uh, for one, Taskmaster is a mimic. And so if you do one move, he does it to per- perfection. So that's why it's so hard. It takes multiple people to defeat Taskmaster. But a one-on-one, you don't want to be in a battle with him because everything that you do, he counters it and does it better. He's a constant learning... He's partial... I don't know about the whole cyborg thing, but I do know that he has a photographic memory in the comic books. And so anything that he sees, he visually can replicate it within seconds. And that is his, that is his power. Uh, the fact that this is Dragunov's uh, daughter from the explosion, um, I did see that coming, Austin. I, I, I definitely agree with you on that. Yeah. But yeah. I was just so upset with the reveal. Not that it's a woman. I don't care if it's what gender is in the costume. It was just like really you, you had to add some kind of depth to the villain to make him have heart to do what, do what he's doing. Yeah, there was there really? was no emotional attachment. Yeah, it, established. Was, it was nothing. And and I think the best part of Taskmaster's story arc is her getting the serum blasted in her face and waking up from his trance. Yep. I think that was for me. I mean, he does get a there is a decent amount of Taskmaster screen time into this, mm-hmm. but I I just feel that they really fall tremendously short on a character and a villain that in the comics uh, went toe-to-toe with some of the biggest heavy superhero names in the Marvel Comics world. Yeah. And it's just like now they've dwindled him to no more than this really cool robot-looking face with a hoodie. Well, and and not to interrupt you, Joe, but the thing is about the setup for Taskmaster, like I was getting revved up for this big craze, at least a big showdown showcasing taskmaster skills i don't feel like we got that we in didn't. that final showdown um even though you know everything about taskmaster like the score every time taskmaster would come on screen the music would get the and it'd be epic in this chorus and i'm like man i'm loving this character but kind of like very different but kind of like the mandarin in iron man 3 you get that reveal and it's just like ah okay you know and that's kind of I, I know joe you feel the same way but that's kind of yeah. how i felt when we got that yeah and you know i i feel um For me, I kind of feel they did Taskmaster more justice in the Avengers video game that came out uh, by Square Enix last year. Uh, Mm -hmm. If you guys out there on the PlayStation or Xbox world know what I'm talking about, he gets more he gets more evolution as a character in the video game world in the gamer verse, as they call it, than he does on the screen. And there's only like one scene on the bridge when Natasha's going to get gasoline. Uh, that, you know, he comes and, and blows up her car and then they try to do the pose and he mimics her pose. And that's the only time in the entire Taskmaster world that he mimics his opponent. 
He doesn't mimic like when Red Red Guardian is fighting him. There's no mimic there. It's just straight up combat. And I'm like, man, they, you really fell short on this. He could have been. I mean, could you imagine Red Guardian fighting his equal counterpart? Because yeah. that's exactly what he does. He mimics everything that he sees and does. Mm-hmm. But uh, that was, um, yeah, for me, that was a big letdown. The, the third act was 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 definitely a lot of CGI. I got to echo Lindsay on that. It just kind of. Well, it, your your husband Josh, it kind of felt like a little Michael Bayish. It did feel a little Michael Bayish. It felt a little Michael Bayish, and I'm not going to lie. Um, for me though, I got to overlook that because I can I can see the intent in which this film was made, and I think it's going to appeal to a larger multitude of audiences. The only reason that we're picking it apart because that's what we do here on Pop X, and so I feel there was there was some parts in there, Taskmaster. Dragging off, yeah, I don't know. It could have been refined a little bit more. I'm not into the Marvel Studios world. I have no say so whatsoever. I'm just a guy on a YouTube channel that reviews movies. And at the end of the day, that's pretty much what it is. And so I know my place in the world. Okay, I'm not Kevin Feige. Yeah. I'm Joe Burke, and I'm on yeah. Pop X Cast. Uh, quickly, how did you guys feel about the the end credit scene? Oh, as short as it was, yeah, we should probably oh, yeah. talk about that. Oh yeah. Um. So. The ending credit, we see Valentino, who we already seen from uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Mm-hmm. Originally, this was supposed to have been before Falcon and the Winter Soldier, so we already should know who Valentino is. But thanks to the pandemic, we got Falcon and the Winter Soldier first and then Black Widow second. And so we see Valentino approach, you know, there's this really somber scene where you're seeing Yelena walk up to her sister's uh, tombstone. And just kind of love on it and just kind of, you know, have this moment of solitude. And then you hear somebody sneezing and blowing their nose in the background. And, of course, it's Valentino. And she's like, I got uh, your your next target. And on the tablet was, of course, Hawkeye. Hawkeye. And I'm like, wow, that's going to be interesting. Is that going to tie into the Hawkeye series? Uh, how is that going to play out? And are we going to see um, Florence's character evolve into the next Widow in this series? Is it going to be a is is Black Widow and Hawkeye going to is there going to be parallels in this new Marvel series that's currently in production? We don't know. Mm-hmm. Maybe Austin can shine some light into that. I don't know, but uh, be very interesting to see that. And I thought it was a really good instant credit. I kind of figured you can't do a Black Widow film without some Natasha Romanoff homage at the end of it, acknowledging that she did die and that this is currently where we are. Um, but I thought it was a good scene overall, perfectly. So, uh, it, Marvel does a they do a great job of of hiding things from us, and we know that Hawkeye has been shooting. I I think they kind of just told us what that show was going to be. I, I think a big part of that is, of course, Hawkeye is going to be training Kate Bishop, uh, right. Kate Bishop, and that's going to be a big part of it. But we also have now someone that's after Hawkeye, Clint, and yep. inevitably. I believe that's going to be the transformation into Black Widow. I feel like Hawkeye is going to talk some sense into her. Yes. She's going to be the new Black Widow, and Kate Bishop is going to take over the role, and I think Hawkeye actually retires or dies in his, uh, what will be, I believe, his final outing in the MCU. I think this will be the last we see of Jeremy Renner. So there, just from that post credit scene, there's a lot of things. But also, we now have... Uh, uh, Julia Louise Dreyfus's character approaching two integral characters yep. in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Thunderbolts. R- very much mirroring what Nick Fury did at the beginning of all of this crazy Avengers madness. And what Joe just said, I think she is forming a team of not superheroes per se, but more maybe anti-heroes at first with now John Walker and now uh, and now Florence Pugh's character and I'll be interested to see who else she gets and I'm also interested to see what team that team well, will go up against maybe the new Avengers or the West Coast Avengers I'm very excited to well see West that. Coast Avengers they've already set that up with white vision yeah they did but they? let's talk about the elephant in the room that nobody has talked about all night Thunderbolt Ross mm-hmm. oh my goodness yes was Did you hear what Natasha said on the phone to him? What is this, your third triple bypass right now? Oh, no. Did you did you catch that? I did. I, I did. In the comics, spoiler alert, he becomes very sick and he hates Banner. Oh, boy. And guess what he does? 
Oh, boy. He takes the serum. <laughs> and so they are alluding to it. Right now, we're going to get the Red Hulk. And I do believe that the Red Hulk is definitely a part of the Thunderbolts because guess what? He is General Thunderbolt Ross. Yeah. He's the leader sounds, of the damn Thunderbolts. It sounds like it's leading that way. Uh, and so, you know, he's also over the prison that is holding Mr. Baron Zemo right now, who could also be, man. Come on. Lining up. It's lining well, up. You the think about this, are too. are all set in place. We, all, we also have, there's so many young characters right now, too, in the MCU that are forming the new Avengers, too. And we've got, uh, shoot, there's Kid Loki and Loki. Yes. You've got uh, yes. She Hulk's coming. She Hulk's coming, so you know you're going to get all of that. Oh my gosh, dude, my mind is just melting right now with all the possibilities. <laughs> but um, all in all, we're talking Black Widow, and there was definitely a lot of stuff here that we can we can take. You know, Valentino, Thunderbolt, Ross. You have the new Black Widow, essentially established at the end of the film. Um, Red Guardian is still active and out there, so we don't know. And where- all of the former widows. Yeah, yeah, like, you make a good army point. Of widows. So wow. I don't know that what's have been gonna set free. Now I think their their mission is to go free all of the, the other, other widows. They're going to replicate the serum. So I yeah. think that that's going to be kind of like their next step. They're going to reproduce the serum, see. and they're going to free the widows from <laughs> well, the mind control. And you know, this is not the last we're going to see of Taskmaster. And that, for me, that's why the jury is still out on Taskmaster. What we've seen so far, I'm like. Okay, you know, yeah. but maybe like a Bucky or Winter Soldier, the more we learn, the more fleshed out character. So I am going to uh, just wait and see on Taskmaster. Yeah. I feel like it's not the last we've seen of her right. character. I, 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 I hope that they do justice for the Me Taskmaster. I, I don't care. Like I said, I don't care if it's a female or a male. At least stay true to the origins of the comic to some mm-hmm. extent. I mean, Kevin Feige is overseeing this, mm-hmm. but... Um, I kind of felt it was like a Deadpool moment in X Men First Class. A little bit. Remember when Ryan Reynolds showed up with no math, no yeah. no mouth rather, yeah. and he was like, "I was like, oh, that's Deadpool, great." And then she took off the mask, and of course her face is burnt. And I'm like, oh, that's Taskmaster, great. Who's that? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so Lovely. yeah. So should we score this sucker? Yeah, we can go all night, Lindsay. I know. <laughs> really? I know. We have, we've, you we've got kids. You got you got kids to get in bed. But then there's that one. No, I'm just messing with you. Oh my all right, so it's summer. <laughs> all right, so in honor of Black Widow, ladies go first, and then Austin, okay. and then myself. Um. All right. I did not hate the movie. I think it's a very enjoyable either. movie. Oh yeah. Um, there was some nitpickies. Um, I am going to rate it lower than Ghostbusters. Just FYI, at a. 7.7, I think. Hey, that's fair. actually good that's, score. Yeah. That's still that's good. Pretty fair. That's good. It's still, good. It's still good. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. All right. We'll Burke, what'd you rate? I think this is a win for Marvel. I do it. And I'm actually really excited to watch it for a second time. As of right now, I'm a 7.4 uh, for my score. I just, you know, it may, just because it's not top tier MCU yeah. doesn't mean it's a failure. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is mid tier for me. But it's one that has room for improvement, and there's a lot of uh, pieces set up for the future. So a 7.4 for me. That's awesome. I want to do a 7.9. I was on the verge of 8.0 at the beginning of the show. Uh, well, at the beginning of my second viewing last night. Let me let me rephrase that because I, I did see this twice. And um, I, I, I'm i just happy that we're in a theater watching a Marvel Studios production. Mm-hmm. And people yes. are laughing and cheering and having a good time. I don't care. It, you know, at the end of the day, yes, we can nitpick it. The third act is what it is. It can't be changed. It's all, it's, it's done. But I was just truly, I truly enjoyed the film. Yeah. And I kind of feel this is, this is going to be a film that I will own in my collection that I will, you know, definitely go back and revisit many times because I feel that this is going to be one of those films that even though the third act isn't pivotal, there's a lot of things in this thing that's going to trickle into other films and productions Absolutely. of Marvel Studios. Absolutely. And so we're always going to go back. Well, did you remember when Thunderbolt said that? And uh, Or you remember feel, when? Yeah. I feel like this movie is going to be, I'll, I'll, I'll appreciate it more with a couple more watches, but I don't feel like it's going to be the most memorable of all the MCU movies. I feel like well, it's going to get lost in the in the outshining of all of the other bigger, better ones. Right. Well, and what what do you all think too? Now, 
this is a prequel now. What if this would have come out after Civil War? Do you oh, think I it feel like it would have been much better? I agree. I, I think timing was an issue here. And even the pandemic delay, delaying the original release date hurt it even more. I think it kind of hurts the feel of the film, which is really unfortunate yeah. for it. Yeah, yeah, because, I mean, you're we're trying to go back to the era of Civil War. And that was that a was while a back. That was five, six years ago, right? Yes, it was. Isn't and so... 2016, mm-hmm. I believe. I think. Yeah, 2016. That was a like long that. time. Mm-hmm. So A lot of things have happened. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I had to refresh my memory really quick. I was like, wait, Sokovia Accord, she's in violation. That's talking about Civil War. Mm-hmm. Okay, I understand now. And mm-hmm. and wait a minute, Ant-Man's in prison, and so is the Falcon. They're talking about, okay, okay. So then yeah. I, yeah. I, no, I'm sitting and here trying to remember are. everything yeah. that happened at and the end of Civil was, War. she um, was being under arrest for attacking the King of Wakanda and that whole yeah. thing. Yeah. 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 That was just like, wow, that's a whole lot of storyline that was a long time ago. I'm I kind of wish I would have really watched Civil hard War. to remember it all. You know, I kind of wish I would have watched Civil War prior to going into this. That way it kind of gave me a refresher. Yeah. Um, I think they should have pre uh, clause that, you know. Yeah. You know, on the hills of Civil War comes the Black Widow storyline. Do you guys want me to share my crazy fan theory? There's yes, share your share your fan theory, that. and then we got to wrap this thing up. We are. I know we're running out of time. We've already gone way long. Right so, um, I, I, it's funny that we had Stranger Things in the news today, and we're talking about Black Widow at the same time because here has, we go two things that I'm going to be talking about right now. You guys know that we ended the last season of Stranger Things <laughs> with David Hopper's, Harper's character, Hopper, yeah. dying. But then at the very end, he ends up in Russia. Mother Russia. Somehow he went through the upside down into Russia. <laughs> hmm. What happens after Russia? I don't know. Maybe they captured him. They wiped his memory, turned him into a super soldier, and slapped a uniform on him and called him Red Guardian. <laughs> the saying and and Lindsay adding adding on to that. Do you remember the Russian character in Stranger Things season three who was with them who actually died in the season scientist? Three? What, was, what was his name? It was. Alexi. Alexi. So he adapted the name of his fallen comrade. It all makes sense. I'm just sense. saying. Holy cow. I'm just saying it could happen. <laughs> they have, they did not confirm or deny that they're in the same universes. So I'm just. What the hell kind of fan theory is this? <laughs> what in the world? It kind of goes along with that one I was telling you earlier. You know, the Titanic uh, falls into the Terminator world because uh, <laughs> Jack was was supposed to say. It was just a Rose. goofy thing that I came up with last night whenever we were on our way home. But Obviously, you, I was very delirious and tired. But, man, it could be real, Well, man. if this That's story gets stuff. reprinted anywhere, we you heard it here first. This is Lindsay Badger's. So if you see this on comicbook.com or Superhero Hype. It's probably going to no. be in the Reddit feeds. No, no, that... This is this is Lindsay this Badger's Lindsay. baby right here. This was Lindsay. <laughs> For I also mind. you're welcome, Real quick, nerd hey, verse. <laughs> so so Jeremy in the chat uh, also mentioned another great Easter egg that I completely forgot about. Uh, the name Crims- Crimson Dynamo Crimson was actually Dynamo. mentioned in Black Widow. It uh, was. They were calling Red Guardian oh Crimson Dynamo, but that's actually a reference to one of Iron Man's greatest villains. So I love that man. There are a lot of Easter eggs and lines of dialogue oh, yeah. in this movie uh, that could just slide right past you. If you're not All righty. <laughs> wow. We are going to wrap Anyways. things up here, guys. Um, man, what a jam-packed show. As you can see, we can talk for days about yes, Marvel. Could. And especially Ghostbusters, and we have no regrets at all because we just love talking about it. But with all that said, we're going to wrap things up. Austin, you're up, buddy. Well, I'm Austin Burke at the Burkinator. You guys can search and find me on the interwebs. We are also part of a newly formed creative group known as the Creative Multiverse for more great media content, artwork, and more. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at the Creative Multiverse. If you are a creative, produce content, or have a talent, we want to see it. And would like for you to share it with us in the multiverse. I'm talking quick because we're a little over time. Today. We got to talk. We got to talk. It's all, all right. right. So uh, you can connect with everybody here on the social medias, including PopXCast at PopXCast is that handle. If you want to email us with anything, I don't know who would, but if you wanted to, um, PopXCast at gmail.com is where you would send all electronic mail. And for future and past shows, make sure you go to our website. It's official. It's popxcast.com. 
Oh my gosh. And I'll tell you what, it's, this is really awesome. We are part of an amazing network called the Creative Multiverse. And I want to invite you guys to join us. I ha went ahead and pinned the link for our show on HAPS. Nice. Uh, which is the Creative Multiverse PopX After Show. If you look in the top of the chat comments here on your YouTube channel, where we are streaming from, you will see a link. So join us there in roughly 30 minutes, and uh, we will hang oh, out with you guys. There's bedtime bell. There's the bedtime bell. Ding-a-ling-a-ling, ring-ding. Uh, but I'm Joseph Burke at Joseph Burke Arts all over the web, and I want to say hats off. Amazing team, PopX, as always. I love you guys. I just love Aww. geeking out with you on these Sunday we nights. I love you guys, too. It's Thank so fun. You. And that's it for this episode as we are uh, going to set our eyes to 127, where we're going to be talking about, A, Masters of the Universe, and the Loki series finale. Mm -hmm. We're going to be unpacking all of that. And the Retro Rewind, inspired by none other than this Lindsay Badger. Lindsay, tell them what we're doing on Retro Rewind in two weeks. The Labyrinth. Oh, oh. snap, baby. Joe, That's you remind me of the babe. Oh. <laughs> the babe with the power. Oh, my gosh. So July, 20, <laughs> July 25th will be our next show. So you guys mark your calendars right now. Masters of the Universe is coming out on the 23rd. Third, so we'll be right on the heels of that episode one. Are they doing this a weekly or is this going to be all at one time? I believe it's all at one time. And Good. I believe it's only what I've seen. I think it's five episodes. But they're like 30 minutes a piece, right? Yeah, 30 yeah. minutes. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm on. So we will be doing Masters of the Universe, Loki Finale, and The Labyrinth. My goodness. On 127. Are you guys ready for it? I know I am. With all that said, we're going to wrap things up. We're going to have our good friend take us out here, and we'll see you next time. From everyone at PopX Cast, thank you so much for listening. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and click that notification bell so you know when we go live next. Drop us an email, popxcast at gmail.com. Throw us up a like on Instagram and all those other social media outlets at PopXCast. Until next time.